turn this this light on over here. It's a fucking nightmare. But <laughs> it, it, it lights up. Pretty, I mean, it is it is really really frustrating, but it lights me I up. Took us, I took us live right when you dropped your your f bomb. So oh, hopefully, you, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully your mom is not a subscriber. That's probably even better, actually. That actually gives me like a normal hue, normal yeah. tone. Yeah, now I don't look like uh, a vampire. Count Von Jig. All right, let's do it. Shadows. It's basketball time at the Rubber Rim Job, season three, episode 13. What's up, my brother? Man, I'll tell you what. Uh, lucky number 13. Yep. Got back riding high from uh, taking my uh, my Cav uh, fanatic son to uh, the uh, Minnesota game. Which, Wait, did you uh, did you check out the game in Cleveland or did y'all go to Minnesota? It was in Cleveland. Cleveland. That game was in over, Cleveland. Over we're, time play, we're playing them in Minnesota like quite soon, actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, 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 that is actually the second game of the back to the back. Uh, this Friday. No. So we went to that game in Cleveland. Yep. And uh, that was one of the best Cavs games I've ever seen. That's awesome. We happened to watch <laughs> it in person. So you're two for I, two. That that Milwaukee game and then this game right here. Like you you you're hitting four thousand right now for great games. So I'll give you some I'll give you a couple bullet points on that game. All right. Number one. We got to watch. Uh, we got to watch warmups again, okay. which obviously watching. You mean you're there to watch the game, but watching warmups to me is awesome. I've always loved watching warmups, and I wanted to introduce my son to that because when you got to, when you get to watch elite athletes warming up, right? It's amazing, right? Like because you nothing just better, this, right? Like, that's really what you pay for is to get in there right? and see their routines and. The whole Isn't game cool? day experience that you can't catch on TV. I love it. I said I said on another podcast that I like to watch, uh, like on social media. I, I I don't do a lot on social media, but like as far as watching goes. But one of the things I do like to do is I like to watch athletes practice because I like to see right, what they right. do, and like seeing that in person is just so cool. And I, I told Luke, I said, "Listen, you're gonna be blown away by how few shots these guys miss." I said, "Like you're gonna see." centers shooting threes and you're just going to be blown away like i said you're going to Effort, see point guards effortless. dunking effortlessly yep. and and he's like he's like you were right and i said i told you man i said you're gonna i said you're not gonna i said this will be the loudest thing you've heard in your life so far and it was it was it was definitely a playoff atmosphere which is right. cool so that was number one that was super cool number two was i love like fun fan interactions right that's like a fun thing so the guy in front of us um, uh, pissed off the girls. Like there was this group of girls in front of, in, like to, directly in front of us. And then the guy. All, all Cleveland like, fans that we're talking about. Yeah, all Cleveland fans. So it's like okay. this group of like three girls who like, you know, young girls. Like I, you just got the vibe. They were there to socialize, right? right you know right, what I'm right. talking about. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. They're this doing it for the comes, gram. They're basically. there for the gram. Yeah, totally okay. this guy comes into the right and shoes them off to the side and he's he's right that they were in the wrong seat so he's in the right okay but they're frustrated and they're pissy about it okay so this is exciting to me i like this i like this yes. stuff and i'm watching some annoyance brew and i'm watching them talk about it and i point it out to luke and i tell him i'm like this kind of stuff is fun to watch i'm like kind of watch this develop and he is and he's kind of giggling a little bit <laughs> and then i see the guy on the right drop his pretzel on the ground and i comment about it out loud i said oh man that kind of sucks and the girl in front of me hears it and she goes i guarantee you that guy eats that pretzel <laughs> and the girl like, in front of you was one of the three one yeah of she's three. one of the three that got pissed <laughs> off because she's the one that he kicked out Okay. And so I'm sitting here and I'm like, I actually thought of you because I was like, you'd make a prop bet on that pretzel. Absolutely. I know you would. I know you would. Guy and picks up pretzel and eats it at plus 300. That's good exactly. Money. Exactly. So I'm <laughs> laughing with her about it. Right. <clears throat> right. And I'm thinking much to myself. I'm like, 
he looked like the kind of guy, if you know what I mean, that would eat a pretzel off the ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, he, he chomped right into that pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's, here's the variables that you've got to be able to disclose for us. Okay. Was, was the game active when that fell? Uh, it, no, not yet. Not yet. Cause it, that matters. We like the game is active. Up. Deep okay, I was about to up. say if the game is active and it's right before halftime when that big crowd is about to go out there, and you're gonna have to wait until halfway through the third quarter to get back gotta to your eat. seat, you gotta eat it. Man's gotta eat. Yeah, man's gotta. And I mean, that's an investment. And you know what I'm saying? Like those pretzels are like 15 bucks or something. Totally, like that. absolutely. No, yeah, I don't blame so. them. I don't blame them. I to me, it's all about the fan interaction. Like. Because it's like, you know, and I, I explained this to Luke. I said, listen, man, part of the whole fun is like when there's a big dunk or like if you're at the Browns game, like there's a right. touchdown or whatever, hugging with fans, giving each other five, like right. predicting an interception and it happens. There's nothing better, right? Like all that kind right. of stuff. It's all about that kind of stuff. But But like watching little spats develop to me is exciting as well. It's part of the game. It's part it's part of the game, man. And that was fun. That was fun for me. Okay. There was also a guy off to the left who was like yelling just wild, wild stuff out there. <laughs> like it was just off the wall stuff off of the court. Right. And we were watching his weird age difference, maybe mom or something, getting really pissed off at him. And as the game went on. I was noticing her get so frustrated with him that she eventually had to guide him off the uh, out of the stands in yeah. a really good game. Yeah, how old was the guy? The guy was a kid. Man, he had to have been in his forties. I mean, like, <laughs> so yeah, he was a kid. <laughs> yeah, I guess kid. <laughs> All right, so let me um, yeah. let me interject. So like, go ahead, um, go ahead. You know, I go to multiple games every year, and yeah. I like to yeah. try different stadiums and stuff. Definitely. Um, and so without a question, and here's what makes me like happy <clears throat> knowing that though, cause your seats were awesome seats. You were like a couple of good from seats. Court. Definitely lower good bowl. Seats. Right so, behind Austin. Um, you say what? We were right behind Austin. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Like, so there's, it gives me hope because there was a point in time when they first overhauled, like the way they were trying to put all the corporate stuff down low and stuff. Mm. Um, where you would not get some of this, you know, like, no, I went, no. I went to a couple games at the rock where we were just surrounded by ties, corporate ties. Yeah, I stuff. hate that. And it, it felt like we were at a library or like a, um, right. uh, 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 what is it called? Where they sing opera. It felt like we were at an opera. That's the worst. Oh man. So, um, but m my faith in humanity is being restored. One from hearing this from you. Two, that game at Oklahoma City that I told you about. Yeah. Totally erased any fears I had that that was happening like league Good. wide. Because that I'm, when I tell you this was a college bas basketball atmosphere, legitimately, Good. everybody in the section was like, everybody was interacting with each other. People were fearlessly diehards about their team. Good. And so, you know, it's restoring my faith. Let me tell you my most, so... Uh, my ex-wife, one of our first dates, we actually went to a Browns versus Steelers game. She oh, was man. she's from Steubenville, Ohio. She, okay. I'm gonna totally like show her the link for this. So, because I tell this story so much, but um, now that we're like really good co-parents and really good friends, she totally takes ownership over her role in this. So we <laughs> were that couple. We were that couple that you were talking about. Um, <laughs> I'm a diehard Browns fan. She's a diehard. Like literally she brought a towel, a terrible towel with her to this game. Okay. And early in the game, Josh Cribb returns a kick return for a touchdown. And we were winning this game like 14, nothing for most of the game. I know the game you're talking about. Oh man. Right up until um, I want to say Butch Davis got I scary and took the air out the ball. And it like, yep. this is 2000, 2004 or five. Oh man, like it broke everybody in that section's heart because yep. it was 50 50 Brown Steelers fans. <clears throat> so, where's my? She was found this the one he dropped the ball on the sideline at first and then returned it. Very possible. It's, okay, go on. So, go when on. you're in person at a football game, you don't get to see the details that you get to see okay. at a basketball yeah, right, game. Right. 
Yep. Like you literally, you have to rely because when it happens in real time, you high five and everybody around you and Definitely. y'all pushing and you making yep. sure you don't spill your beer and stuff. Yeah. But then you, you got to wait <laughs> until the TV timeout so you can actually see what happened on the exactly. field outside yeah. of what the little specs look like. Right. And I, I'm talking about, I don't care what section you're sitting in, you will not catch the full feeling of the game live. Right. right. Um, so in this, I think in the second half, Butch Davis tries to take the air out the ball and Steelers are like, thank you. Thank you so much. Cowers like, let's go. Um, and this was, yep. I think this was, this was Cowers. This is the end of Cower. And of course the Steelers come back, <clears throat> but before they came back and won the game, when that Josh Cribs touchdown happened, um, there's a guy on the other side of her who I we you know I had been picking on her and stuff. So when that happens, he stands up and we high five and stuff. We're like, Rah! and I was yelling at her like, yeah, like yeah, that's how you do it and everything like that. Dude, she cocked back and punched me dead in my face. What? <laughs> she <laughs> holy shit! At the time, she's a. Uh, She's a grad student at Kent State. She's a doctoral student. Holy shit. And we hadn't had any type of aggression. This is like date number four or five. Like we were like, it was. Um, wow. <laughs> she literally cocked back and punched me dead in my face. <clears throat> and then when everybody around us was like, what the, like, like people like you and your son was like, what just happened and everything like that. She's like, she looks at me. She's like, you yell right in my ear. And oh. she just like, she picked she up her. had the reaction. She picked up her coat, everything like that, and she like walked out. Oh man. And so I'm standing there, I'm like, what? But I was like, there was a part of me that was like, well, oh well, like we probably won't have another date at this. I'm gonna let her go ahead. I drove. So I was like, I'm gonna just sit here for this game. I didn't text to check in on her. I didn't go outside the game. And it I felt justified until we started losing. And then I was like, okay, wait, this, this ain't cool. So <laughs> We were that couple that you you just talked about the dude getting ushered out yeah, by, his, yeah. by his that happened to me at a Browns and Steelers game. That's why I, you were I the told guy. everybody that story so much. My family was like, you gotta marry her. And so you gotta marry her. She never punched me in the face again like that. I wish there's times that she probably should have, but <laughs> we were that we were that that's couple. That's wild, man. Yeah. <clears throat> that's yeah, that's wild. Um I think that might have been the game where he fumbled that ball on the on the baseline. If I'm thinking of the right one, yeah, I remember watching that one. They were up like two or three touchdowns, and exactly, and they took the air off the ball. It's the worst. Oh my god! My um my my other observations about that game were were that 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 is that is funny. Um, (laughs) my other observations about that game were that we were very excited to see Ant. I I I wanted to see Ant. Okay, dude looks like Mike Tyson in person. Uh, ice. Held him down, man. Uh, super impressed. Would you say so? Is a coral like more built? Yes. Than, okay. Okay. Yeah. Than Ant. Yeah. I mean, an Ant I, genuinely in person looks like Mike Tyson. Super yeah. impressive. I love that. I love that dude. He's one of my favorite players, non Cavs to watch. I, I can't, I can't wait to just watch him develop as a player. All right. Um, but I, I, can, I gather you're not a fan. But um, the, uh, I'm, I'm working on it, man. I'm, I promise you, I've I've long been holding out on the Ant Edwards love fest. Oh, really? Because he's 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 viral now. Like he's caught storm every game. He does something that is all I over. Just, I love explosive okay. players who talk okay. smack and are just like just. He's so WWE. And he's he's guy. he's actually a really good. He his personality is good for the league. Exactly. Like anybody that can get like Kawhi to laugh. And then he's a good even player. when he like fights with people and, and has beef, he's still like pulling them in. So he's a goof. All right. You, you you're turning you he's like pageantry. Turning. I'm all I'm all about the pageantry. I, I don't even care. So so to me, and I'm not even saying he's a bad guy. He he's yeah. you know, like I know he had like that weird situation. I just like I like the pageantry. I like guys who who are bizarre. I like I like weirdos. I like guys who just pageantry. I like guys who are goofy. I like guys who do wild stuff and just turn, turn everything briefly. I want to revisit this. You and I were texting about this. Okay. And when we have some things we need to cover, I messaged you about Durant going after those fans in the (laughs) stands. Yeah. (laughs) And I know, I know there's an element of this. You definitely disagree with. I love this thing where these players who are clearly uh, very sensitive 
are going after fans now. Like that's right. a whole element of the game. Right. Uh, I love it. I think it's great. Like, th- like they can't, they can't seem to handle the criticism or whatever. So they're like going after the fans and they're like going into the stands and calling them out or whatever. Kevin Durant, um, Russell Russ. Westbrook. Um, there, there's a Ron couple of the, like the champions of that team. Who? Bron's done it. I think I think Bron is actually the the torchbearer that's allowing these dudes to start doing it more frequently. But go ahead, <laughs> Vernon Maxwell oh. ran. I mean, he walked so all these guys could run. Of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vernon <laughs> with the whole thing on social media where he just trashes Utah constantly. So that's my <laughs> opinion. I like it, and I love the Durant like villain arc that he developed. Right. I'm not even saying <laughs> I'm like fans of these guys in general because they're very grating, but. Yeah. I, I love it again because of the WWE theme. I just like it because it's obnoxious. I want. I would like your opinion on this. So, um, <clears throat> for me, I would very much like. I'm I'm tied. I'm locked in on this college basketball. You know how I am, and this is the time of season for that. Um, and I'm just. It's been hard, like, to switch over to these uh, pro basketball games. When when the conference tournaments and stuff are going on, because everything I want, like these kids are ready to kill each other. Yes. But they play with they they stay within the the lines of what they're asking, like the the refs require. You can't talk back in college like I've even seen coaches like that are like, oh, shit, let me get back in the box, you know, kind of thing. That's a great point. So um, I, I, I just I'm stuck there where I'm like let it overflow in the competition and don't give yourself any outlets with the crowd. Because ultimately when like the KD confronts them, Russ confronts them or whatever, LeBron, the op- the opposing players are like, I got your back because this is a fraternity. And it just takes away from the competitive spirit to me a little bit. Like if, if, if in WWE and re- pro wrestling, um, the the like the people get into it with the crowd the other wrestlers who they're supposed to be like really mad at and frustrated they're gonna have their pro their their the dude's back you know what i'm saying like they'll go in the crowd i I totally understand so for me i'm just like (sighs) keep it keep it between the lines and keep it with that other guy like have all the smoke for that dude with the other color on because that's what i'm really paying to see you know like i do um, i do understand what you're saying do you think that this is actually Part of the thing where they're like taking the aggression out on the fans instead of that lost aggression yes. on each other from the eighties and nineties. Yes. Like, and like, and whenever you watch the games that are being um, like Grant Long does OKC games as a color guy, Rick Mahorn does Detroit. Um, all of, all of these guys are jumping in and, you know, doing these games. Now Vince Carter has been doing some TNT games. They let you know, they they show you that they still have it in them with how they talk about how it's like, man, just, you know, like when the game gets close right here, you know, they're going to turn it on. And they they they're like dying to get to that moment because they're like, this is when it's going to turn competitive. I want to see 48 minutes of that. And so I'm with you. they're they're so aware. This is like I want to give props to John Collins for how he got dunked on by Anthony Edwards. Oh, because guys are not doing that anymore. Like dudes are like, I know for a let fact I'm gonna be. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna just let him go. Um, I love that. Like, thank you, Josh. Uh, uh, John Collins. Like, did you get banged on? Yes. Is that potentially the dunk of the year? Yes. Do I have that much more respect for you? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, so um, to sum it all up, I. I, I hate it because I feel like they're able to release the valve on the fans as opposed to, you know, letting it overflow in the competitive, you know, spirit of the game, which is what I fell in love with in the first place. So. I, I, I like your opinion here. I, th- I think that, yeah. I think, no, I, 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 the, the, the moment where I completely understand what you're saying is when you said that uh, I'm thinking of the, the fact that these guys grow up in AAU together and then yeah. you see them dapping each other up on the court and um, they're all kind of buddy, buddy with each other, which is fine. I mean, I, I'm good with guys like being buddies, but to your point that these guys um, aren't taking it out on each other on the court and it's only like the last couple minutes of the game 
and then you've got LeBron like doing his, you know, playoff mode or whatever. And that's kind of really yeah. it. Uh, and there's only a handful of guys who are doing it. Yeah, that is a little disappointing. I'm with you on that. And then there's only a handful of guys who are, you know, doing the hard fouls and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, and it's, you it's see that. Missing, man. It's missing I, from I, the game. I get it. I, I, I respect that. I, and I was originally talking about it more from the element. I like that meta aspect of, again, <laughs> I, I, I do. And I know we yeah. both agree on we like the wwe stuff but what you're kind of saying here if i gather correctly is leave that stuff for the wwe and let's stick with the competition and uh you know we'll go keep it on the court for the uh you know for aggression the and, and yeah, at yeah, each yeah. other i dig it i dig that i can dig that because there's so many games now where the takeaway is more about what that fan like who that fan is, like who was that fan that got LeBron to do this? When that woman, when he got that woman tossed out in Atlanta, um, you know, those types of things, it totally overshadows now these dudes being competitive with each other. Is and, there an exception? Is like, would there be a time when you think it's appropriate for somebody to respond on social media or within the game? So in the social media, in the in the social media world, I'm all for it. Because I, I okay. think that, that can help bring that competitiveness back. Um, but I want like because when players go at it, like right now, Gilbert Arenas and Nick Young were picking on uh, Jalen Green for getting uh, this one, you know, jump off pregnant or whatever. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. OK. And so it became a viral thing because every everybody, it became like this weird thing that split in half where the OGs of basketball and stuff are like, dude, I don't care what. He, who he picked or whatever like that. You don't talk about a man's, you know, woman or her incoming. But then these newer age dudes are like, ha ha. Yeah. Like I had my turn with her too. And all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of oh. like, so the old school dudes, everybody who takes, but there's some current players who are taking that side over there too. That are taking the old school. And really? it's become, oh, this, I haven't seen any of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's become this litmus thing for me where I'm like the people who jump on that side over there with the old school guys. I love those guys. Like, bring me more of those guys. Those are those are candidates for bad ombre. Like, give me those. The guys who jump on the Gilbert Arenas and Nick Young side, get them the hell away from my team. I don't want. I don't really care to see them play. You know that kind of thing. I do. the The reason behind that is there was there's something old school about like women and children are off limits. Like, don't like it's not even funny. Like, I don't yeah. care. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like Draymond Green is o- entrenched over here. Right. Um, I'm, I'm saying over here, I'm talking about that old school side, like the the guys yeah. who are like, yo, that's not cool no matter what. Um, but then another modern day guy, um, I said Gilbert Arenas and Nick Young, who thinks it's funny. Uh, and you can just you can tell by the way guys play on the court. Um, like Chris, Chris Paul is over there, of course, he's he's absolutely, absolutely interested over there. I'm going to shout somebody out and watch. We're going to go look online and they're going to be like, that's not And cool. they're sitting in there. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. It's probably <laughs> the guys who have been in the league longer anyways and probably came up like starting in the maybe like early mid 2000s and are just hanging yeah. around in the league still. Just like, and they just don't take the game seriously. Is serious Udonis like, Haslam still playing? <laughs> yeah, Udonis Haslam. Like, yeah. like Juwan Howard, where he just got fired from Michigan, but he right. was like trying to kill people over his son. Like he's yeah. over there. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. We need more of those guys. Charles Oakley, kind of Anthony Mason. I just saw a video of Charles Oakley, actually. I I don't even know how it's just like anything with the algorithm. Like all my videos are basketball because I'm watching this stuff and then Luke's watching this stuff down in the basement. He was talking about who was he talking with? He was talking with another basketball player who like forgot that Charles Oakley was coaching in the league. And I uh, I don't know if I've seen this. He was. Oh, you knew, do you remember that he was coaching for a couple of years? Yeah, absolutely. He was. He was. I on forgot Charlotte too. Staff. He was in. Yeah, was I, f- in, I yeah. forgot too. And then <clears throat> he, you know they were asking, <laughs> who was it? Was it? It could. It couldn't have been Reddick, could it? It was, it was somebody. And they were asking him like what he thought about like young guys now. And his right. whole point was just like you know these guys are. He was just saying. I mean, guys now are punks. They're, yeah, I mean, kind of. I mean, he, you know, every generation complains about the next generation. I mean, it's a thing. And then, you know, and then they put it on up. But he was just saying, like, you know, you, you can't can't really criticize or, or push him too much. And, 
you know, it was just kind of one of those situations where I thought about it. And then I was like, yeah, I mean, if I was in his shoes, I, I would coach like I'd been coached. Right. And then if right. you tried to do that, Oh, so he was talking from a standpoint of how limited coaching. Okay. Yeah. He was coaching like he'd been coached. Got it. That ain't going to work. I mean, it it just wouldn't work. I mean, it's, it's, you know, and I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how he was doing things in the locker room, but if he was coaching, like, you know, like banging lockers and being demanding and pushing these guys and telling them, Hey, when you go out on the floor, you know, these guys aren't your friends. Like you need to, you need to be pushing right. back and you right, need right, to be right. tough and you need to be playing. You need to you grind it down. It. You can't, you can't force these millionaires to feel that way is what he's saying. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. And you could tell, I could just sense this frustration, you know, like he was just right. saying like that. I, I, he's like, I couldn't coach like that. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, no, it I get doesn't it. work. And so, all right. So yes, let's touch on, let's, let's, let's get into college basketball. Let's put a pin in this. Cause we're going to bring it back up. The title of this episode is Bash Brothers. So yeah, we're going to bring it up. About these dudes. There's a couple dudes. Yeah, we're going to bring right? it up for Bash Brothers and we're going to bring it up in regard to JBB uh, a little bit later in the episode. But um, we got a guy in the studio that's popping up some questions. Let's touch on this real quick. So he says, Rich, who's your final four and your Cinderella team? Everybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm literally I'm going to dive in this afternoon and do my bracket. Like what I try to do is oh, I, I, I give to. myself a good 24, 48 hours after the bracket before I actually jump in and put my bracket together. Um, so I I'm have to be transparent, Francisco. I haven't done my bracket yet. However, I do want to talk a little bit about um, some of my favorites. Um, and so my number one favorite, who I believe is should be everybody's favorite to win this championship is UConn, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan Hurley. Uh, let me tell you what, Jig. So Dan Hurley and UConn played St. John's and Rick Pitino, which Rick Pitino was uh, Donovan Mitchell's coach at Louisville. Played him about a week and a half ago in the Big East tournament, and it was like in the Final Four for the Big East to get that automatic bid. And St. John's is basically a home game. It's not basically they play their games at Madison Square Garden, so it's a home game for St. John's. And Rick Pat- and um, Dan Hurley has his father, uh, Bob Hurley Sr., and he has him strategically placed on the sideline. He's retired because his, his school closed, St. Anthony's closed. But he's got him strategically placed on the sideline right at the edge of the coach's box. And Bob Hurley Sr.'s sole job is to make sure, because Dan Hurley, when games get started, he's ready to fight. Like, as a coach, if you he makes JBB look like a Boy Scout with how he handles referees. Oh, does he? But Dan Hurley's ready to fight everybody. And I think he's one of the best coaches in college basketball. So to watch I'm, totally being to watch a, all. I'm totally being a hypocrite by saying this. I love the way he approaches games, but he backs it up with the X's and O's. Like he knows his X's and O's. Like it's like he drills so hard in their practices that he can actually do what JBB does at the game. And his team knows it and, and they get it. Like, but what you'll also see from him is whenever he's like, oh, wait, my my team is out of sorts, he'll stop assaulting the refs and the other team and the coaches and stuff, and he'll get back into coaching. Like you'll like you'll see it in real time. He's he's the one of the best coaches in college basketball right now. Right. Interesting. Um, so <clears throat> um that game, Rick Patino started working the refs as soon as the game started. Cause he's you know, this for him, even though they're like a four or five seed in UConn with the number one seed in that conference. He's like, man, this is our home game. We play here. Like, you know, you know who I am. I'm Rick Patino. I'm one of the five greatest coaches of all time. I literally watched him say that to a ref. And the ref started keep the, they kept the game close for um, St. John's. Like they were calling some BS. And so at, at the half, I want to say St. John's was up by two or they were close. They were, they should have been blown out. I think UConn was favored by like 10 or 15 and St. John's had it a very close game because of the refs. And so Dan Hurley lost his ever loving mind and, and his father, like who saw that the refs are getting ready to kick him out the game. He gets up and he, he like, you know, he stops him right there on the sideline. He's like, Hey, you know, like lock in, you know, like he's getting in your head. You're letting him, you know, like, cause he was like cussing out the refs. He started cussing out Patino and Patino and the Hurleys. They're like, really, you know, like 
I'm he sure was cussing, out, like, he was cussing out Patino. Man, he was he the other everything. Coach. It didn't matter. It was like I will rip your head off, like in order to win this conference no championship. Kidding. That's what Dan Hurley is all about. So long story short, uh, his father got him together, and his father actually started like talking to Rick Patino, and you know, kind of just trying to like even the the. Hey, I know you're you're one of his mentors, one of my favorite coaches too back off kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it was like, Hey, focus on your kids, like get out of here. And it was just an awesome thing to see. Like there has to be clips online because it was just amazing to see that coach almost lost his mind. His father sitting right there strategically to be like, Hey, get over there and get your kids together. I got you out here. You know, like I'll, I'll do what I can here from the sideline. So you kind of ended up winning that game anyway. They're my number one and my overall favorite. I'm not a I'm going to take all the number one seeds, but of course, my my North Carolina Tar Heels, um, they lost the ACC championship to North Carolina State. North Carolina State was playing out of their absolute minds in that ACC championship. And there was some things that happened for us with uh, R.J. Davis, just like not being able to hit the broadside of a barn Mm -hmm. and Baycott, you know, just was playing out. of. So they're going to approach the tournament because they just got that eye opener in ACC championship. And they're going to be ready to rip somebody's head off. They play um, Wagner in the first game of the tournament tomorrow. Boy, Wagner always makes it, don't they? Yeah, they played in the first four in yesterday, and they beat Howard. Wagner beat Howard 69-66, I think. I'm, I'm sitting there watching that game because Wagner can't shoot to save their lives, but they they were playing outside of their outside of their minds. And Howard's the number five team in the, in the country for three-point shooting, and they couldn't hit a shot to save their lives, so – it's just this this right here is what playoff basketball is all about for the NBA. So and Dan it starts, Hurley coached Wagner uh yes. 13 years ago. Yep. Huh. He started with Wagner. He also coached at um somewhere in the Midwest. And then he came back over to Yukon. Oh, maybe they don't he, make it every year. For some reason I was thinking they did. Well, last year from that conference, it was Farley Dickinson, and they went to like the Elite Eight. They upset a number one Purdue and they got pretty far. So that conference is not like some doorsteps like like North Carolina has a game in front of them. But, dude, I, I'll, I'll totally take us off like talking college basketball. So I don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, UConn is a favorite. North Carolina, I believe both of those teams will definitely be in the final four. OK, but then let me look at these brackets while we're talking real quick. <clears throat> Why did I think Wagner makes it inconsistently? Maybe I just saw their. They're good pretty consistently here. Yeah, no, I think they went a um, couple of years ago, but I they they never spoiled anybody the way that Farley Dickinson did last no, year. No, 16 beating a one. <laughs> yeah. That was incredible. In real time here, we're about to pull up these brackets, and then we're going to switch over to Cavs Talks. I don't know everybody's like, what the hell are these dudes doing? Yep, so I got UConn coming out of the East. Um, Houston is number one. Marquette is number two. And Kentucky's number three in the South. I think I watched, was that UConn I watched beat the hell out of uh, Marquette during the regular season? Yes, yes. Man, it was, they didn't even look like they were playing the same sport. And I love me some, I love me some Marquette. You know, they got Shaka sure. Smart from University of Akron. Absolutely. I used to play ball with him, Jamal Ball. Shinda Wolf and those guys. It, it wasn't the even hip, close. The Hipshire brothers. You know, it wasn't close because Marquette is not in the same in the same ballpark as UConn. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm not sure about the South right now because I don't have faith in Houston. Like Kelvin Sampson and his kids, um, they just play football. Like it's all about defense for Houston, and they got upset in the second round of or the second or third round of the Big Twelve because they'll just go through phases where they're like it's, they don't look so hot but let me tell you something really quickly jig this guy uh, nebraska is in the south and they got this japanese steph curry have you heard about casey tamanaga Mm-mm. for nebraska if you get a chance this is one of my tournament darling stories it's a eight nine c nebraska and texas a&m but this casey tamanaga this dude i i started watching him halfway through the year for big 10 um and Nebraska had upset somebody like Penn State that they weren't supposed to beat. 
And this kid could not miss. Like he just he went in fuego. Like, and at first I was like, oh, he's just a catch and shoot guy, kind of like uh Sam Merrill. But this dude started putting the ball on the floor and he literally patterns his game after Steph Curry. Like, so does he? Does he look like him out there? <laughs> he's a they're an eight seed, he's a senior, and he's like a yeah, six he's been three. hitting some threes. Yeah, he's been yeah, no, this kid is crazy. I think he averages 15 a game, but in the last couple of weeks, he's been yeah. doing like 20 and 30 a game. So yes, that's exactly what he's been doing. So for the South, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you not to lock Houston in as a number one. I do not believe they're gonna get through. You got Houston as a one seed, Marquette as a two seed, Kentucky as a third seed, and Duke as the four seed. That's probably the top, that's probably the toughest top four. In the Midwest, you got Purdue as a one. I do not see them getting through. Yeah, they've been struggling. They've definitely been scuffling. Tennessee is the second seed there. The third seed is Creighton. Creighton Akron, which is going to be a good game. Kansas is the fourth seed. Gonzaga is the fifth seed. I don't know how I feel about the Midwest, but no, like none of those teams right there really scare me. Um, if I had to just pick one right now at gunpoint, I'd say Tennessee as the number two seed. They got this kid, Dalton Connect, who's going to be a lottery pick this year, Jig. Dalton Connect is like a 6'6 shooting guard. He reminds me so much of Allen Houston. It's not funny. He's like a white Allen Houston. Allen Houston. Houston. And this kid, um, as long as you give him a little bit of space, he's going up for it. Like, he's fearless. He'll take the shot. Dalton Connect is, um, he has a, he, they got shut down in the SEC tournament they lost against um, Mississippi State. And they just were, they just were too physical with them. So Tennessee's going to learn from that, and they'll probably be pretty tough. I, I got them coming out of that. Right now. Yeah, wow. He's putting up some numbers. And then my last, of course, is the West. North Carolina's number one seed. Arizona's number two. Arizona would scare me, but there's just something to them. And if you, if you don't know the backdrop story to this, Caleb Love was a three-year starter for North Carolina Tar Heels. Him and R.J. Davis together were like Sexton and Garland. They were taking turns, but they were both like lead guards who both could be the player of the year. And so he transferred to Arizona. And for his senior year, R.J. Davis is the player of the year for the ACC. Caleb Love is a player of the year for the. Um, uh, oh, shit. Out West. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the conference, but he's player of the year for the Pac-10. And there's something about Arizona, though. Like I've watched every game of theirs this season because everybody's like, oh, they're the favorites. They're going to be this and that. They have five players who can make it to the pros as their starters, right? Yep. But there's just something about them. Like uh, it's, when, the, when the lights get too bright, I watched them get upset by Arizona State, um, by Oregon State. This kid named uh, Jordan Pope up there at Oregon State should not have beat them. And then just now for the last game of the regular season, I watched them get upset by USC, uh, Bronny James and, and his his band of misfits. Yeah. So <laughs> when it comes down to it, Arizona, there's I just I don't feel like they're going to be buying a it. I'm not buying it. So North Carolina, UT. Who did I say in the South, in the Midwest? Give me give me Kentucky, the three C Kentucky, because I don't have faith in John Shire and Duke. In the South, it's going to be Kentucky or Duke. Three or four is going to make it through to the final four. And then number okay. one, UConn is, is, is the four I'm taking. So, feel like UConn could win the whole thing. Yeah. I, UConn is my favorite. North Carolina is my number two for those. And the other two, the Midwest and the South, uh, they'll dispatch of both of those teams. So, all right. So, do you have a team that you're like, I, I got to keep a, keep my eye on these guys for this time. I like watching here. UConn. They, they were really the only, they were really the only team I watched more than a few games from this year. I watched, I, I just, dogs. just because I have some family members that are from Indiana. I watched some Purdue games. Um, I don't really care about them to be honest with you. <laughs> They're hard to watch, they, man. They are the big lurpy centers. Don't do it for me. Yep. I can't, I can't do it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll be rooting for Connecticut a little bit. Okay, I'll do I'll do some UConn. Otherwise, uh, I'll just be looking for good games. I'll flip back and forth. I'm a, I'm gonna give you a couple more teams to keep an Please. eye out for. Yeah, I do. Um, I do. so LeBron's high school coach Keith Dan Brat, he's coaching at Duquesne, and Duquesne is the Atlantic Ten, or whatever that conference is. Yeah, Duquesne's out here, actually. Yeah, yeah, in Pittsburgh. Um, his wife is actually battling breast breast cancer 
And so for the second half of the season, Duquesne was like a 500 team because they were just kind of like, you know, trying to get it together, but not senior laden enough. Mm-hmm. And she started having to fly to Chicago and he started missing some games and stuff because I think it was touch and go for a little while there. And for the last 10 games of the season, they just locked in. And I don't know if they just dedicated it to his wife or what, but they they got the uh, they they won their conference tournament. They really shouldn't have won it. But they kind of it was a Cinderella story just getting in. Okay. Duquesne is playing. Do 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 Where is Duquesne at? I should know this before I'm referencing this. They're playing BYU in UConn's bracket as a 6'11. Let me tell you guys what. I would not be surprised if Duquesne upsets BYU as a 6'11. So that like Literally, that's going to be on tomorrow, uh, one of the early games. Take Duquesne over BYU for that game. Okay. Because these kids are playing for something bigger than themselves. Yeah, that does it a lot of the time. There's no reason why they should have won their conference tournament. They upset quite a few teams. And Keith Dan Pratt, he's really got them playing like for something that's bigger than that. And there was one more team that I was like, let me give these guys this if we touch on it for the rubber rim job. Um, My other upset special is 611 in the Midwest, South Carolina versus Oregon. Okay. South Carolina is a six seed. They're led by Michi Johnson out of uh, Cleveland. You know, the little kid that every he went to Ohio State. Mm-hmm. LeBron, you know, LeBron and they were going to his games and stuff. He's a he's like a quintessential combo guard. He can light you up for 30 or he can give you five and ten turnovers. Yep. Um, but this year, he finally, the, the light went on for him, and he started actually running the offense and, and playing pretty tough and everything. Um, but when the chips get down, like against Florida, I watched him be taken totally out of the game. Um, when uh, when other team has a bunch of pro athletes, he gets taken out of the game, and South Carolina falls apart. Oregon That's- has a bunch of pro athletes. So Oregon, you know, like uh, Dana, whatever his name is, that's up there in Oregon. He's he's the dude who gave us uh um what's his name in Houston that everybody hates the swing man uh dude that came from Memphis and everybody like absolutely hates him he's like a uh, oh um, I hate him um <laughs> I can't remember, I can't remember his name because I hate him so much the I Canadian hate- guy so he came from Oregon they have a team full of guys who play just like him like. All they do is scrap. All they do is like try to get in your face and fight. I had Oregon pick to to win the pack um, pack ten, um, to upset Arizona, but they I don't think they got that far. So, okay. Oregon will upset South Carolina, the eleven six seed, and okay. keep an eye on um, Duquesne upsetting BYU eleven six. Okay. So, all right, that's all I got for college basketball. Let's get into this pros right here. Let's get back to the pros. What what the hell is this dude's name? I can I can picture him. He's so weird. Uh, I, it starts with a D. Yeah, um, I know it does. Hang on, I'm finding him. I'm finding him. Because let me tell you what, Jig, Ime Adoka has got them close to 500 basketball right now. And yeah, I know. He had them running everything through Alper and Changun. When that kid went down for the season. Within a week, he had them fully adjust the way they were running their offense, and they look better running their offense now. Dylan Fred Brooks. Van Vliet, Dylan Brooks, thank you. Got Fred it. Van Vliet and Jalen Green has exploded ever since yep. Changun went down. Jalen Green is averaging like thirty points a game since Changun yeah. went down. Yeah, this. I I wish we had jumped on Ma Odoka, man. I know he had his personal stuff, and you got to worry about this. You got to worry about that. I'm telling you, this dude is like one of the top five coaches in the league. Like, and I, I promise you, lighten things up. Wow. I promise you, he is going to have uh, Houston in the playoffs, like maybe as soon as next year, depending mm-hmm. on what all they do. Oh, yeah. The around and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so, anyway, college, college, you know, all of that. So, this has visited our doorstep. And let me tell you why I'm kind of excited and happy about my Cavs. Okay. They, I don't care who you give credit to, give it to JBB, give it to Kobe. I don't care. Let me tell you why I am 100% sure we will get out of the first round this year. Whoa. Okay. 
You wow. put Mark, you oh. put Marcus Morris and Tristan Thompson in the locker room together, and they don't like kill each other and rip each other from limb to limb. They're like they're gonna band together. Like these dudes are gonna have this team playing with a purpose. Like the same way that Thibodeau had the Villanova kids basically end our season last year. Mm-hmm. He brought the he brought um, mm-hmm. uh, Josh Hart and Jalen mm-hmm. Brunson together, mm-hmm. and everybody followed their lead. Like even mm-hmm. Julian Randall, uh, Julius Randall was like, "All right, let's let's do whatever y'all say we need to do." Mm-hmm. Let me tell you how far back Tristan and Marcus Morris beef goes. Right, so. We're talking in high school when Tristan was playing for Finley Prep out of um, out of uh, Las Vegas and the Morris twins were playing together. They hated each other at AAU. Like I watched a um, summer ball thing where them two were playing. I literally thought they were going to jump Tristan in this game. Right. Fast forward to their freshman year, uh, Tristan's freshman year and the Morris's maybe junior year or their no their senior year because Thomas Robinson was uh was a sophomore Thomas in Robinson Kansas at the time. Ah uh, that's a guy forgot him in that thread of guys you thought were gonna work out. God well, you just had to put that on me. Yeah. So uh Thomas Robinson was the backup for the Morris twins at Kansas and they brought him in and they were like all right now it's three of us let's jump this dude and they basically the first time that they played Texas Tristan and Texas upset them in Lawrence, Kansas. And these dudes were pissed because they were trying, they came out and they were trying to rough him up in the beginning and the refs were calling it really tight. I think both Morris twins and Thomas Robinson all had two fouls in the first half. Tristan was wrecking havoc on the boards. They could not contain him. Uh, Jacobin Brown for Texas. Look, look this kid up. He had like the game that out of his mind, he scored like 30 off the bench. They upset Kansas in Kansas. So the Morris twins, who've always hated Tristan Thompson, they did not like that he was considered a better pro prospect, all of that. They get him back when they went to Texas for the the home-and-home game, and they upset Texas. I think Tristan had four fouls. He was in foul trouble that whole game. They bullied him throughout that game. And so it's always been, you know, they got to the pros, and they've just always been right on the brink of, like, coming to blows. Like there's always been this undercurrent about, and I guarantee you in the locker room, the Morris twins, like he's such a punk. He's such a, he's just awkward, all this kind of stuff. And Tristan is like, you know, I hate these dudes kind of thing. So the fact that these dudes finally unite and they're coming together and just in that first game, you already saw immediate dividends when these two backup bash brothers came in together. Went right out there. Smoking threes. That is a game changer for, a bunch of boy scouts, you know, like I was happy with Tristan being brought in and I'm not talking about um, the way that they play. Right. Like, of course, yes. You know, like you want some type of contribution. You don't want a guy just over there with the towel slapping right. ass and everything like that, right. which Tristan is a MVP at that too. Yeah. Um, you slap ass, but give me something on the court. You feel slap ass. And so these two, there's something to it, man. Like you remember like when, um, Hulk Hogan and Macho Man finally got together after being like kind of like we hate each other a little bit. They mm-hmm. they were the mega powers. Mm-hmm. And like six and seven year old Jig and Rich was like, oh, anybody that goes up against them, you know, these dudes could be Andre the Giant by themselves mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's what Tristan and Marcus Morris are. Interesting. I like as it. These, as these backup bash brothers. And what they're going to do is they're going to empower some of these Boy Scouts, you know, like the Darius Garlands, the Evan Mobley's, you know. We've got a couple of guys who they don't need to be influenced by it, but they will carry the torch like Max Struess and and Yang, Bang Bang Yang Gang. They were already cusp. Yang is tough. Yang's a tough guy. Tough guy. So you add. This is a tough guy. You add the fact that these dudes are already that. Donovan stuff. And so what we saw last year were like cream puffs, like Mitchell Robinson got tougher as a result of Josh Hart and Jalen Brunson being the, the full backbone. You're going to get that this year with uh, Marcus Morris and Tristan. Before the game even starts, they're going to be challenging dudes. They, you're going to let this dude come in here and take your lunch. You're going to let him come into the rock and take, you know, like they're going to give us that. Like I'm I'm super excited about it. I don't care who you got to give credit to. Give it to JBB. You know, somebody, people on the board have been like, he was jumping and, and shouting and screaming about it. That's fine. The fact that they're willing to fight for each other and with each other means that we're not going to go out in the first round this year. 
So that's my whole soliloquy about the backup bash, brother. I like it. No, I think it's great. I think you absolutely need guys on that team. You need guys yep. who are going to make things a little uncomfortable around there, uh, even with each other, um, just to push the other guys, uh, whether it's around or out on the floor. Right. Yep. Yep. You know what I mean? Because the team had been <clears throat> a lot of Boy Scouts, and that became very clear against the Knicks. Right. Because the whole reason the Warriors have been successful, and Curl will tell you the same thing, is because um draymond green is the backbone of that team right because if you just had curry and um clay right. and whomever you know they throw they've thrown around those guys for all that time running around off picks and moving the ball around but you had no draymond backing them all up and scaring right. the piss out of guys they would not have had the success that they had they needed his crazy ass in the middle backing them all up right? Right. right and um they don't have you know these guys aren't as good as dre but they do have that toughness to back them up and um i'm i'm ab- i agree i'm absolutely loving it i wasn't expecting him to go out there and hit four or five threes whatever he did dude that's like um, found money honestly. yeah that's found money for sure but i agree with you i mean they're clearly a better team when tristan's out there and available right. whether he's on his uh his testosterone or whatever it is or not. <laughs> whether he's whether he's taking deer antler or not, we want. Yeah, right. Report, right. But he's right. available and he's out on the floor and you, yeah, he's pushing guys. Um, and to have a second guy out there doing it too. Let me um, let me say this real quick. Big, it's big. How about I knew for one hundred percent fact he was going to injure one of our big four as soon as he got back. I promise you, I'm not like trying to be sarcastic. Tristan has yeah. always been yeah, this big, awkward Canadian. I, I call him that he's on a, the board. He's an oaf. He's an he's oaf. An oaf. But the problem is, he's gonna take out one of your guys too. Like Absolutely. you can count on him taking out that's one of them. That's what oafs do. He's an oaf. That's exactly. That's that's the best word I can come up with for Tristan. And Donovan, who you know, like has since the All Star break, Donovan's been halfway in, halfway out anyway. I think this. This kind of helps us give us a reset for him because he's like, man, I'm I'm just trying to be at home right now, you know, wiped up and stuff. So go ahead, take care of your nose for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Get that out your system. Hopefully, you know, process whoever that is that's laying around out. Get back and let's lock in for the playoffs. Um, so we may have to thank Tristan for that. Cause when I saw him connect on that elbow, I was like, uh, I think he just broke down of his face. And yep. sure enough, he broke down of his face. So Welcome back, Tristan. You big oaf. Let's talk. Um, let's talk about the um, the guy who has been frustrating me the most uh, all year long. Right. It's not Drippy Dean Wade. <clears throat> it's not Donovan Mitchell. It's the other D. Darius Garland. I, you, you, don't come for me. Gee, don't. I'm not coming for you. I'm not because I, I have the feeling you're on the same page as me. This guy, yeah. this guy, man, it's like you could get you play him all 48 minutes. You get 45 minutes of Leonardo da Vinci or whoever the hell it was painting the Sistine Chapel. It was somebody right. that <laughs> sacrificed his entire body for the Sistine Chapel. And then in the final three minutes, he just take his paintbrush and just swoop, just I'm just gonna do all this a yeah. whole thing over. It's like, bro, like what does he need a psychologist? <clears throat> does he need like does he need to to just like take a couple rips from the bong on the sideline? Like, what does he need to do? Like, what do we need to do to settle this dude down and unspin right. him? Because he is clearly spun up in those last two minutes to to three seconds he is not I, prepared out there can i give you time. can i give you yes. my fix for Darius garland and i mean I want i'm it. saying this from the bottom of my heart because i want it i want it offline offline we've talked about this uh oh, brew is trying to get me to brew is trying to get me to lose my shit so we're just gonna i'm just gonna let this show for a second and i'm gonna get right back to my my thesis mm. um shout out to you brew because you you almost got you almost elicited a response from me just now that was, you know, huh. okay. 
<laughs> so here's here's the Darius Garland um, Harris. enigma. Um, you know how I've, I've told you often, one of the things that I run into trouble with running my business as a, you know, like, um, is being able to shift between the creative and the administrative. Absolutely. You know? Like, um, sometimes I literally have to take, I have to leave out of here, take a 100%. walk and come Absolutely. back with, with the other brain, with other mind. And contacts. Stuff. It's a contact um, shift. Because if I'm not fully locked in as I'm leading with my creative brain, then I, I give you some shitty creative, right? Yep. But then when I have to switch gears and I have to do the administrative, cause I've got some, I have some subs that are doing stuff for me right now. Um, and literally I'm like, I got deadlines that are due today where I'm probably gonna have to move off of some of these guys and just be like, Hey, you know, like we don't have more time for this. You can't be any more creative. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll lose I'll lose projects if I stay in that creative brain because the creative brain is going to be like, I know these guys are going to deliver. They're going to give me some awesome creative. The client's going to be happy, but clients don't care and they don't want you to take longer than deadline in order to get this shit done. That's right. Same thing happens with point guards. And we, there was a I, I wrote this whole thing on the board, point guard, combo guard, scoring guard. There are and I mean this from personal experience. When you approach the game one way, it's hard to switch over depending on what they need to something else, right? Like mm -hmm. if if Darius Garland approaches the game and he's approaching it like I'm going to be a true point guard, I'm going to get everybody going. I know Donovan is not not playing today, so I'm I'm going to lock in and make sure that I get JA moving, make sure I get this moving, you know, all of that kind of stuff. He he gives us Steve Nash. He gives us that probing, over dribbling, trying to make the perfect pass guy. Mm -hmm. If Darius Garland approaches the game like I can, I can be Steph Curry today. I don't have to bring the ball up ninety percent of the time. It's not my job to get everybody going because I know, you know, like Donovan's going to do it too, or you know, whoever's come off the bench is going to keep these guys locked in. He approaches the game from a different mindset, and he gives you. You know, something totally different. I think what we saw just in this last game, for an example, in the first half, Darius was shitty. OK, so like in that first half, he was like over probing. Um, I think he might have went one for six or seven. Um, who do we play in the last game? I'm talking solely about his output. Uh, uh, the last Pacers. game Pacers. was Pacers. Yeah, yep, Pacers game. I think he had two assists, two points one for six or seven in the first half. And he just looked like, what are you doing, dude? Second half, JBB did something that was brilliant that I was like, I've been calling for this because he started Karras in the first half anyway. And part of the reason why Darius looked like that is because Karras was on the floor, but Darius was bringing the ball up. Mm -hmm. So JBB said, all right, I'm going to take Darius off the ball. We're going to get in our shit faster. And I'm going to, as soon as Darius gets the ball across half court, I want him to attack. I want him to, you know, like just let that thing fly. And what happened? We went on like a 10 or 12 0 run to start the third quarter. That is all you have to do is just be like, hey, Darius, you're off ball. OK, like literally you I need you to play the ball like Steph Curry 2014 and on. Um, mm -hmm. You're you. I don't I don't care what the defense is dictating. You know, like you want a survey. You can do that from half court. We're going to have somebody else bring the ball up and, and you just take over as a secondary ball creator from there. Um, if we get that Darius, if you remember against New York, that's actually what worked uh, because Karis and Donovan we were running they, like a horns, if I remember correctly. Right. Right. And so it was hard for New York to adjust. And in the first half, they were like, oh, wait, we didn't know that they were going to let uh, Donovan and um, uh, Darius was off the ball when he when he killed them in that game in that game. two was a game two or game three of the playoffs. Um, and so it, it's, it's a mindset shift that he cannot do in real time. Like he can't help it when he approaches the game. Like I'm in control of these dudes getting going. He's going to over probe and play like Steve Nash. When he approaches the game, like it's not my responsibility to bring the ball up. I can just attack. And I'm, I'm just looking for want him off ball. I want him off ball. Like that's, I mean, I, I'm reason, with that. Especially I tell you what, you know what he did that. He ran like a motion offense set right. on that last play where they got Jarrett the ball and then got it to ice and then ice finished. Right. Like 
beautifully with a, right. with a it was either a ball fake or a head fake i can't remember I, I when i i was like whoa what was that set yeah and if i recall correctly darius was initially off ball i can't remember if that was an out of bounds play that kind of stuff too yeah so i <clears throat> I think Darius is struggling from what we've seen the problem for a coral up until this season. Um, we're, we're, if we simplify the game for him and just say, Hey, j we just need you to do this. And then he yes. can get back to being natural and playing downhill. Yes. Um, Cause what we're seeing right now from a coral and every coach should know this by now, by the end of the season, I'm if ready. he gets the ball in transition, they tell him to just go to the rim. I don't care if you, the ball, the guy with the ball, I don't care if someone else has it. Go straight to the rim. They will find you. Do not be, don't, you know, don't even think twice. Go straight to the rim. Okoro is doing that, and he's able to get his footing, and he's playing better as a result of it. He now has purpose on the offensive end. Mm -hmm. um, Darius is back to waffling and trying to switch between two different brains, depending on if Donovan's playing or depending on if, you know, like he's sharing the backcourt with CPJ, if Levert's on the floor. Like, I don't care. Like, just... Even St Max Struess can bring the ball up if if one of those other guards are not in. Take him off the ball full time and have him as a secondary guy ready to create. And you're gonna see more, you know, five for seven three point shooting games because he's just he's gonna have a different mindset on how he wants to attack a defense as opposed to being a guy who gets everybody else going. And by him playing aggressive like that, it's gonna free things up for him to get other guys going. Yeah, just like absolutely. you saw in that Pacers game. Well, he had I. I think in that third quarter he had two threes and four assists in the first two or three minutes of the second. What about half. final? What about in the final two possessions? I mean, if if it's the final two three possessions, you still want him off ball? Yes, because he go he literally clams up, uh, and this has been all season for him. I agree. 100%. When when in the in winning time he goes back into his head, he goes back into. I all agree. Right, I want to get the perfect play, and then I want to spoon feed Jared Allen because I know they're going to try to do this and do that, and it's like. DG, we don't need that, man. So like, who gets ball? Who we, gets ball? Um, Donovan? Then or Karras? Donovan or Karras. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay Kar with Karras. You would give the ball to Karras LeVert. Give the ball to Karras LeVert um, if Darius Garland and Donovan are um, on those on those wings or giving him action off of that. I agree. I um, agree with that 100%. And so, in, in Karras LeVert is a tremendous slasher. Tremendous slasher. Don't get me started on this. He just stuff. is. He j I know. He just is. Oh, yeah. I can't believe you put that up in the, on the screen. He is. He's a tremendous slasher. He's built, he's built for those circumstances. Karis will and give you a million dollar drive and a two cent finish every time. And it's so frustrating because you cannot account for that. Like he's he's the most, he is the he is the dictionary face of uh like inconsistency, whatever you expect from him, he's going to give you the opposite of that. He plays at his own pace. So you can count on him doing that and it helps. Um, but if you go back and look at his stats only in losing situations where the rest of the team has halted and he's just like, all right, well, I'm just going to be myself and just do everything I want to do, but you cannot build a championship run off of that. Of course. So of it'll, course. you know, give you want him the ball in Donovan's hands. Or if you yeah. have to, or if you have to, he, he's, he's a, to me, since we have him and we need him, I yeah. do think he's, a, he's a good, <laughs> I don't want to use the word brick, but if you have right. to build a brick wall, he, he can put some bricks in the brick wall for you. Karis, Karis is that dude that's in the, in the freezer, in the deep freezer that you're like, we can either go out and eat out, eat something crazy or something like that, or I got to get started on this right now. And it's not really what I want. It's ground beef. It's ground beef. He cares his ground beef. It's like, all right, like if let if I cook. really you got a lot of if I really put the effort into it, I could probably make some magic happen with this thing. Um, if I'm just if I'm just kind of like going through the motions, everybody's gonna hate it. Like, don't give me meatloaf with Karis Levert. It's ground beef. You got to throw like, them in the pan and let them cook. You got to, you got to, you got to come up with something. You got to put something to it. That's like, so, uh, yeah, no, Darius Garland, in order to unlock him, take him off the ball and let Sadly, him play off. I the have ball to get rolling. Minutes. I have to get rolling a little oh, short shit. today. All right. Okay. How much time you got left short. before we close this thing up? Not like no time, like a minute or two. All right. So let me, let me say this real quick. 
Um, we got three minutes. Tonight. I'd say three minutes. Okay, we got tonight against Miami. Um, mm-hmm. This is what I want to see for the next, you know, ten or so games. Let's keep being consistent with the rotation where the Bash brothers are able to come in together and set the tone physically. Uh-huh. Um, I don't care who else is playing, like with the starters and stuff. Keep that Bash brothers coming in together and setting the tone thing happening because that's going to win you the first round of the playoffs. No question for me. Um, and I'm pretty excited about games that. For, for, yeah, I mean, they got enough games for them to get comfortable together. Man. Because you watch them tonight against Miami. Miami's a team that's always scrapped with us Absolutely. and everything. Absolutely. And they're going to game plan it to like take advantage of him, uh, Marcus Morris's limited mobility and stuff. Because mm-hmm. we 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 kind of like sneak and got him away at at the three in that la- in that game. We played him at the three a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you won't be able to get away with that with Spolstra, but I think even if he's exposed uh, on the defensive side a little bit. Um, the tone that him and Tristan are going to set together, like you want to keep just being being consistent with that rotation kind of thing. So that's a team I'd much rather catch than the Sixers. I will say that the idea of coaching JBB coaching against Spolstra is a concern, but it's it's much less of a concern than playing a healthy Sixers game. All right, we got to get in that next episode because I'm the, the total opposite of that. Are you? Yeah. Wow. I am the 100% opposite of that. Opposite. I know Spolster is going to push buttons and find a way to expose you over the course of seven wow. games. I don't have faith in Nick Nurse doing that with a bunch of uh, misfits. Interesting. Interesting. But, um, let's, we'll touch on that let's, on our next episode. Uh, yeah, let's hit that on the next episode. So next episode, we're going to talk which where we want the Cavs to land right. and which teams we're most concerned about them playing against. I love that. Give me, as of right now, give me four or five against New York again, please. Because I'm that convinced that our Bash brothers are going to be able to break that whole thing Tough up. it out against us. You think yeah. that they can crack the code? Well, yeah, we're not getting punked in the first round of the playoffs like we did last year. Not with these two Bash brothers down there. Literally. Wow, you think that's of, the that's the, that's the the cheat code for us, those two? Yes, absolutely. I love that. Like, I'm that convinced. Like, I'm I'm so sure. We were missing a third big which is what Tristan can give you without giving you any offense. And we were missing somebody who could inspire the Boy Scouts to not get punked. Um, and so we got that with Tristan, Marcus Morris, Struess, who goes about his business like with a, with a lunch with a lunch box, but he will not be punked, and George and Yang. We've got enough of those guys, and we've got you know those two Bash brothers who can set the tone physically. Bring me New York again. So I dig it. All right. Well, rubber rim job. This one's going to be a little bit shorter and we're going to get back in the swing of this because we got to cover half the stuff we didn't cover on the next. Yeah, we left more to talk about on this next one. So we'll get back to you guys. Signing off, brother. Signing off. A little tight, but we got we got a lot in there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I knew that if I got.